Welcome back to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast brought to you by Violet Defense. Violet Defense is dedicated to protecting our world from germs by bringing the power of UV disinfection to everyday spaces. Their patented technology enables them to harness the power of the sun to incorporate ultraviolet light into products and environments like never before. Whether you're ready to implement existing products or you'd like to explore researching and developing a custom deployment of the technology for your school, Violet Defense has the solutions and the experience you need. Thanks again to Violet Defense for sponsoring the Educational AD Podcast. The FIAAA also wants to thank our diamond sponsors, including Varsity Brands. Varsity Brands is BSN, Varsity Spirit, and Herf Jones. Varsity Brands, elevating student experiences in sport, spirit, and achievement. The FIAAA also wants to thank our great platinum sponsors, including Ephesus Lighting, innovating a brighter future at every level. Booster Digital Displays, revolutionize your game day experience. Camp Mobile, where leaders communicate better. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. Vital Signs, bring student achievements to life. And Gipper, sports graphics made incredibly simple. Thanks to all of our great sponsors. Welcome back everyone to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We've got a very special guest today, Lena Taylor. Lena is a two-time Olympian. She's also the founder of Close the Gap Leadership, which provides team building, leadership training and coaching for individuals, for teams, and for companies. Lena, welcome to the podcast. Jake, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, we're very excited. Uh, uh, obviously, you know your way around the world of athletics, and now you're uh, you know, working, uh, continuing to work in athletics in a unique way, and uh, you know, we're excited to have you. We always like to let our guests, excuse me, let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests so tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, where you grew up, you know, how you got involved in sports and, and maybe a little bit of how that led you to uh, create Close the Gap. Yeah, thank you for asking. That's a really good question. I firmly believe that sports and being involved at a young age in sports has given me this foundation to learn how to overcome obstacles, right? This is the most basic thing that you learn when you're training your body, because this is how you get better. You have to challenge the body in order to get better physically, mentally. It works that way all across the board. And this is the basis, you know, I was faced with a lot of obstacles growing up in communist Bulgaria. I'll share more about that. But this is the basis of what built my character and now is building my business in terms of the lessons I've learned and sharing that with corporate America of how you don't skirt away from challenges. In fact, those are the things that you need to go through and to take on some big goals. So going back to the beginning for me, growing up in communist Bulgaria, I know there is a lot of uh, you know, mysticism sometimes about what it was like to grow up behind the Iron Curtain. And, and as a child, um, you know, I started playing volleyball at a very young age, at the age of eight. And volleyball was a way to create a better life because there weren't that many opportunities in Bulgaria. I saw my parents struggle tremendously through life because they weren't members of the Communist Party. And life seemed to be dictated to them in terms of what kind of opportunities that would get. They would repeatedly get passed over for a promotion. And looking from the outside in, you know, as a child, I saw that frustration and that feeling that they had that life was not on their terms, life was not in their hands. And from a very young age, I had that sense of responsibility to 
be really good at what I was doing. I couldn't give them a promotion, right? I couldn't do that for my parents, but at least I could do my part in, in what I was doing. Uh, and volleyball also um, was the other aspect that I think sports provides for people is that it gives you that sense of belonging when you're a part of a team, right? So this is what we talk about in team building as well, is when you create that common bond, something that really bonds you. And at the age of eight, what bonded me with my teammates was the fact that they were all as tall as I was. I was just this really awkward looking tall kid that stood out from my regular classmates. And I never felt like I fit in. It was like the ugly duckling, you know, remember that story? <laughs> so when I walked into that gym and I saw the other volleyball players, the other girls that were just as old as me and they were as tall as me, I thought I found my swans. And so from that moment on, I had that sense of belonging um, that, you know, that, that volleyball and being a part of the team and then striving to achieve something that was bigger than ourselves. You know, winning a national championship in Bulgaria, that was one of my early goals. Um, so those were just the beginnings. And by the age of 11, I had to make a decision. You basically had to decide what are you going to be in life? Imagine that, imagine that for a second. At the age of 11, you had to make a choice, whether you're going to commit yourself to being an athlete or be a diplomat or be a scientist. We had these super rigorous exams that we had to pass at the end of sixth grade to commit to the specialized school that would train us with the skills to be that person that we wanted to be. So I committed to being an athlete at that point. And, and I realized very quickly that, just like I said, volleyball was more than a game for me. It was becoming the vehicle. It was becoming the ticket of how I would basically engineer, design the rest of my life. Um, by the age of 16, I had made it to the very top level of my club team. Now, that was the team that the national team coaches would look at to select the players for the national team very important milestone, if, as you can imagine. Two days into the season, we get a new coach. The new coach decides that I am, I don't, on paper, she hadn't even really seen me play much, but on paper, it didn't look like I had the qualities that she wanted to invest in. She wanted to win a national championship. So I wasn't the tallest player at, by that time, you know, many other players through the selection had passed me in height. I wasn't the strongest player. I wasn't the fastest. So on paper, it didn't look like I had the qualities that she wanted. So she told our captain to tell me that I'm cut, I'm off the team. Now you can imagine, right, hearing that news at the age of 16, when you've spent half of my life up to that point, I've spent half of my life to, to, to develop myself. And it's not like I can go back and start something new. Everybody else had spent by that time, you know, another five years getting really highly specialized training in something. So to me, that was a devastating news. And it was also became the impetus of my awakening in terms of shattering my illusions. See, my illusions up to that point was that if you work hard enough that people will notice you and you will be given opportunities. In that moment, I saw my parents' life starting to repeat in my life. And I went home that night and I did what any 16 year old would do, which was don't even tell your parents, shut the door to your room and cry your eyes out. In the morning when I woke up, I thought if I am awake, there has to be a different way. And that in, during that night, in that really dark, dark place that I was in, that I thought my, you know, my whole future is gone, I realized that if I want something, I have to create it. It will not be given to me. And that realization gave me the courage in that moment to make a decision. The decision was that I would go back to my team. I would go and face the coach in the very possible humiliation that will happen now in front of everybody when she would kick me out publicly. But I was ready to be humiliated and would rather get humiliated than to give up on my dream. 
So I went back to practice and I took my spot. Now the coach, in, in, in that time in Bulgaria, you have to realize that the role of a coach was very close to that of the, the police and military personnel. In fact, part of the training that in order to get accredited as a coach, you had to go through a part of this military training. So it was unquestioned authority. And, and I wasn't there to rebel her decision. She could see that very quickly. She looked in my eyes. I wasn't rebelling against her decision. I was standing up for myself in that moment. And I was, without saying any words, I was saying, I won't quit. This is the most important thing to me and I will do anything to make it happen. So she kept walking and didn't say a word. I took that as a second chance. She was giving me a second chance to see how I could prove myself. And from that moment on, I quadrupled my efforts. Whatever I thought I was giving up to that point, forget it. I quadrupled everything. And by the end of the year, I had made myself invaluable, meaning that I became a starter on the team, proving not just to my coach and to my teammates that I belong, most importantly, I proved it to myself. Like that was my awakening in terms of if you want something, you have to create it and you have to step up to the plate. So that's part of the history of um, from there, I went on and was selected to be on the national team. But I had to make another pivot uh, because of something that happened on the national team, which was um, I had, you know, we had qualified to play in the world championships. And we were in Portugal getting ready for the world championships. Now that was a really important competition again, because now international coaches could see me play there and potentially ask me to join their um, club teams. And I, this is how I would become a professional player. Well, right before we started playing, an official came to our team and asked for me. And I raised my hand and he said, you're disqualified. I was disqualified because somebody in our volleyball federation had made a mistake copying the wrong birth date from another player's passport onto my paperwork. And I even, you know, age group, everything, I was even a younger player than what the other players were. It wasn't a problem with what, it was just a clerical mistake. Oh I, no matter how hard I tried to explain that, no matter how many petitions we tried to do, it was, I was denied. I was denied playing. I couldn't even dress into my team's uniform to, you know, to be on the bench. Oh so goodness. that was, that was another pivotal moment. Again, going through that, the devastation of the initial shock, but looking at what did that mean in for my life, I decided to make a pivot at that point. I decided to, you know, I can't be dependent, even though I would do anything to make this happen, there are still things that can happen to me that are dependent on someone else. So in that, in, from, from that experience, I decided then to pivot and make education my priority, get a scholarship to play in the United States, get my education, graduated with a degree in biology, went into pharmacology, and that was kind of giving up on my Olympic dreams to play indoor volleyball and, and turn to education and doing other things. What, uh, what an incredible uh, story there. I, I love the, the lesson of perseverance where you decided to go back and, you know, as you said, you weren't rebelling, but, uh, you know, you were showing the coach that you weren't going to give up. Uh, you know, what a great lesson for all of us. Uh, uh, I'm, I want to go and ask you a question here. Uh, so uh, hopefully I'm not going to get uh, sidetracked, but one of the questions that we ask our athletic directors uh, has to do with leadership and mentoring, which is so important in athletics. And so I, I'm curious, you have really, um, you know, demonstrated, um, you know, a lot of internal, uh, you know, motivation and drive on your own, but um who might be some of your mentors, uh, you know, from growing up or, you know, even people that maybe you've worked with uh, at the Olympic level and beyond uh, the voice or the expression I like to use is I still hear those voices in my head. So uh, is there any voice that you still hear? Absolutely. And it's the voice of my dad uh, from very early on saying in our household, we had this saying, there's no, I can't. 
there's no, I heard that since I was probably a baby. <laughs> My dad was also an athlete. He was a rower. He didn't make the Olympics. Um, he came really close, but it was the other boat uh, that made it to the Olympics. And I think as a result, he had that kind of drive is just instilled in my sister and I from a very young age is there's no I can't and and I felt that support from my parents really early on even as a six-year-old you know they had a lot of confidence in me and um and put a lot of responsibility on me and put a lot of tasks on me that were probably beyond my years um, and, and I was responsible for things like taking my sister to school when I was only eight years old and, you know, navigating um, a two million people city, Sofia, to take the bus to go to school by myself. So there were, th those things were something that I learned through experience very early on is to figure it out, figure it out, ask questions um, and, and figure it out. So that was the, the earliest influence on me. It's interesting because um, being a coach, myself too. So I, I was coaching at Coast Volleyball Club in San Diego for a long time before I took um, and became the director of the club. I started working with Mary Jo Pepler. Mary Jo Pepler was one of the most amazing athletes of her time. I don't know if you remember the all-star competition, like 1976, her and Billie Jean King were going head to head on ABC, I believe it was, and, and, and Mary Jo won that competition. And she had just mastered volleyball. She won a national championship uh, collegiately and then was the director of uh, Coast Volleyball Club when I started working for her. Now, I seeked her out because I knew of her accomplishments, but once I heard her speak to her coaches, I knew that I wanted her to be my mentor. I wanted her, I didn't dare ask at the time to be my coach um, on the beach, beach volleyball, but I said, if I work for her, I will start absorbing these lessons. She had an incredible approach of respect towards the individual player. So she looked at a player that was 11, 12, 13 years old and, and treated them like a whole person. Now, this was something I didn't get in Bulgaria. You know, I told you the story of how we were, we were treated kind of like part of the machine. It's like you make it or you're gone. You know, you conform to these. There was no recognition of your individuality and what you contribute as a person absolutely not so it was it was the opposite experience and and once I saw how it could be done it became my model of how I even raise my kids you know I've just been so inspired by Mary Jo Pepler she's one of the the people that I look up to no I, I'm actually old enough to remember uh those names so I, I appreciate you sharing that uh you talked about um, you know, you had uh, come to the United States, you know, you'd gotten a scholarship, uh, you got your degree, and you actually had, had kind of, you know, left volleyball behind. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, you got involved with beach volleyball. So, you know, how did that happen? And, and just what an incredible jump from not competing to becoming a two time Olympian, you know, uh, how did that happen? That was exactly what it was. It was a jump. There was a huge gap between where I was at the time after college with a degree in biology, working in the pharmaceutical industry, had you know, given away my knee pads and all of my athletic stuff and thought, you know, I was just kind of messing around on the beach, living in Mission Beach in San Diego and would play on the weekends. And that's when I saw beach volleyball being played in the Olympic games. Seeing that on TV, reignited that childhood dream of mine that I had inside of me to play in the Olympics. I never thought it would be possible to go back to Bulgaria, join the indoor volleyball national team. I knew that route was closed once I left. But I thought, now beach volleyball is an Olympic sport. What if, what if, what if I could qualify? I just need one other person to play with me. And so looking around, I said, who can I play with? Well, I had helped my sister get a scholarship to the University of San Diego to play volleyball for them. And living in San Diego, I said, hey, you play volleyball. 
come on, let's try this new thing. Well, she hated it. If anybody has tried to transition from indoor volleyball to beach volleyball, you know how hard it is to even just walk on the beach, right? How wobbly we feel just trying to take a step. Now imagine trying to master the skills of jumping and you know, timing of the ball. And when the wind is blowing it in every which direction, when the sun is in your eyes, the sand is everywhere. So my sister, my younger sister hated it because she was used to, just like I was, to a certain level of competence, right? Especially when you're a division one player. My sister was a phenomenal indoor volleyball player for University of San Diego. They won the conference several times. She was a first team All-American for two years in a row. Um, and one of those was with Misty May and Carrie Walsh, uh, the top six players in the U.S. So. So she was really good, used to a certain level of competence. And when you start something new, it's very humbling. It's very humbling. But what I did right in that moment was the I took her to the world championships of beach volleyball. The world championships were in Los Angeles. I said, let's go and just watch these players play. So when she could see them in person, that kind of you know lit the fire in her belly and said, come on, let's go do it. Well, you can imagine... I had just graduated from college working for pretty much minimal wage. She was still full time in school, so she couldn't work. I had to start working three jobs now to, in order to make ends meet and save enough money to try to pay for these expensive tickets to play on the international beach volleyball tour, which is how you get to qualify to the Olympics. It's a two year, very grueling qualification process that has you flying all over the world. So while the other players were training full time with coaches supported by sponsors or their national federations, here's us, my sister and I, and I'm working my butt off from you know 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then trying to squeeze in practices whenever I could in early in the morning or late at night. And, um, and it was one of those, it, was, it seemed so impossible to be honest with you to have this to make this leap from where I was sitting on my couch watching beach volleyball and the Olympics on TV and then wanting to be that person on TV. And this is what I talk about in my leadership academy is how do we close that gap, right? You know, what, what are the steps we take to close the gap between where we are in the moment, where we want to be? But that was, that I was staring at, you know, the Grand Canyon of gaps at, the, at that point. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you just one more funny story about it wasn't funny at the time, but it was uh, related to something I talked about earlier. When we started playing, we weren't very good. We didn't have any coaching. We didn't, we, I had barely saved enough money and actually borrowed some to buy our first international tickets to go overseas and play in a tournament. My big plan was to go through the qualification tournament, make it into the main draw tournament. And there in the main draw, the organizers would give us hotel and food and prize money. So I had only, I only had enough money for two nights of hotel and the rest of the week would have to be in the organizer's hotel. Well, what happened when we lost in our first game in the qualification tournament? We're out of luck. I don't even have a credit card at the time. So I take my sister and I say, we have to find places to sleep on the street. So for the next three nights, we're just looking at different places, getting chased from place to place of uh, finding somewhere to sleep. The last night we found this park bench and we thought, okay, we're set. We can finally sleep here. <laughs> and then the sprinklers came on in the middle of the night, just completely drenching us with water. So that was our start, not a very promising start. But guess what? By that time, through my experiences growing up, you know, being cut from my team, being denied access to the world championship because of the a clerical error, all these other things that I've had to overcome to make it to where I was, I knew that if something was really important to me, I can do it. I can make it happen. I just have to look inside and find that that motivation of why is that, you know, I had to answer the question, why is that so important to me? I realized in that moment that why it was important to me to make the Olympics in beach volleyball, again, it wasn't just a game. It came down to creating a life on my terms, right? A life that would not be dictated by circumstances, by other people's errors, by other people's opinions. It would be a life 
that I create on my terms. And that was the fire that kept me going. Yeah, you know, again, just a tremendous lesson for all of us, you know, student athletes, coaches, and athletic directors about, you know, the, the quality of perseverance. Just so impressive. We are visiting with Lena Taylor, two-time Olympian and the founder of Close the Gap Leadership. We're going to hear a little bit more about Close the Gap and her five principles when we come back. But let's hear a word from our podcast sponsor, Violet Defense. We want to thank Violet Defense for sponsoring the Educational AD Podcast. Violet Defense is dedicated to protecting our world from germs by bringing the power of UV disinfection to everyday spaces. Their patented technology enables them to harness the power of the sun to incorporate ultraviolet light into products and environments like never before. Whether you're ready to implement existing products or you'd like to explore researching and developing a custom deployment of the technology for your school, Violet Defense has the solutions and experience you need. Thanks again to Violet Defense for sponsoring the Educational AD Podcast. We're back with our guest, Lena Taylor. Lena, you were uh, talking about uh, your experience trying to qualify for the Olympics. Uh, let's go and pick up there uh, and share a little bit about that uh, experience as a two-time Olympian. Thanks, Jake. It's, it's really fun to remember now. I, again, at the time, it was very challenging. And I talked about how far away that goal seemed to be and, and what are the steps that we take. Now, looking back, I've been able to see a pattern in uh, what was the most important thing. You know, I, I asked myself, what was the most important thing that we did that allowed us to qualify for the Olympics under those circumstances? And the circumstances were pretty dire. Now, with only two months left in the Olympic qualification process, we had made it, barely made it, to number 73 in the world. Only the top 24 teams in the world get to go to the Olympics. So how would we past 50 other teams in the ranking that were ahead of us in only two months time. Now, looking back, this is the question that I asked myself. I asked myself, what was the most important thing that happened there? And the answer is this, I had to come up with a strategy because I knew how far away that was. I knew how impossible it seemed to pass 50 other teams that were better trained had played the sport much longer than my sister and I had at the time, had coaching, had support from sponsors, national federations, funding, and we had never beaten before. So we know the result that we did it, but how did we do it? The strategy was this, it was actually a two-part strategy that ended up working really well. The first one was, in, in being a scientist, you know, this is how my mind works. Okay, what are the controllable vari variables and what are the uncontrollable variables? I realized that our biggest distraction or the biggest uncontrollable variable in that situation was the ranking itself. There was nothing we could do about the ranking itself, no matter how hard you stared at it. You know, if you're looking at the ranking, if you're looking at your bank account and you want it to have more money in it, it it's not going to change just by looking at it. You have to go out there and do something about it. So our first step was to identify that big distraction. I realized uh, the other 50 teams were not the big distraction. It was the ranking. So we committed from that moment on that we're not going to look at the ranking and that we're going to focus all of our available energy only on the things that we could control. How do we prepare for matches? How do we scout the other teams? How do we take care of our bodies to rest and eat the proper things? And how do we, how do we get into the right mindset? And see what that allowed us to do was that it allowed us to focus and play on the court. It was another lesson of how we could get distracted very often with things that are outside of our control like the ranking, like uh, comments on social media, 
like different inputs that you know could take us away could take our energy and focus away from what we really need to be doing in order to advance in that moment so we gave ourselves that gift of we're not going to look at the ranking we're going to focus only what we can do we know we have to do a lot so looking at the ranking is only going to discourage us is not going to help us and that strategy proved to be crucial it came down to the last game in the last qualification tournament that we passed the last team, you know, and jumped into number 23 in order to qualify. But we were playing unobstructed. In fact, this is how you switch your response from having that, you know, when you're gripped by fear, right? When you're looking at how, you know, what can, how can I miss this opportunity? We weren't looking at that because of the commitment that we had made. We were only looking at what's ahead of us. What's the next step? How do we win the next point? So this is what allowed us to, to make that huge leap and qualify into the Sydney Olympic Games. Now we arrive in Sydney and we're just taken by the enormity of what it is like to be at an Olympic Games because just two months prior to that, we were nobody. We were just, you know, trying to play and jump and do whatever we could in the sand, but now we are Olympians. And the biggest, um, the biggest excitement of that was probably being in the Olympic Village, seeing all the other Olympic athletes. We ended up deciding, my sister and I decided to sign up our dad as our coach, even though he wasn't our tactical coach, but we wanted to bring him into the Olympic Village and give him the experience oh, that wow. he had missed that many years ago, you know, almost 30 years prior to that. And so that that's one of the highlights, you know, seeing our parents in the stands, um, playing in front of the world and just feeling the enormity of that moment. <laughs> it's just uh, such a cool, uh, cool way to honor your, uh, your dad and, and get your parents involved. Well, um, <laughs> obviously, I got to ask, you know, how did things turn out? <laughs> Jake, you're getting me choked up about my dad being in the Olympics and, and, and that moment that we had created. Finally, you know, in my mind, we had created this incredible moment of our family making it through all the difficulties growing up in communist Bulgaria, trying to find a way to make it into the United States. And now we're at the Olympics. There was no expectation that we had that we had placed on ourselves at that moment because we had already done the impossible by qualifying and, and being there. So we, you know, our first match, we played the uh, number one team in the world, Sheldon and Adriana, which was, um, you know, we lost that match, but we had some more chances. Our second match was really exciting. We were playing the other two sisters that were in the competition. They were from the Netherlands and they were a really good team. They were the European champions. And, and we ended up having this, out of this world phenomenal match, Chelsea Clinton was at the match and he created a lot of buzz, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of excitement in terms of uh, beach volleyball was starting to step onto the world scene. It had attracted the attention of a lot of media, a lot of celebrities. And, and so I had started receiving messages from my friends at home um, you know, Chelsea Clinton was at your match and, you know, they were talking about, so it was exciting to be a part of the growth of beach volleyball. Well, here in, uh, in Florida, uh, beach volleyball has been offered through our state association kind of as a, an optional developmental sport for the last two years. And this coming school year, the 21, 22 school year, it's actually going to be a full sport. It's going to have its own playoffs. And so, uh, you know, we're very excited, you know, at our school, you know, we've been participating, you know, in the club uh, category for the last couple of years. So uh, you're absolutely right. It is a, a growing sport across the country. And you see what just happened. We have the qualification process for the Tokyo Olympic Games. And the second U.S. team that's going to Tokyo, if, if you haven't heard, but it just happened last week, is a young team, two collegiate players, and just, just teamed up and started playing in 2019 internationally, but they were able to surpass Kerry Walsh Jennings. 
and denied her the sixth Olympics, you know, which would have been an incredible experience for her to be there. But this is a direct result of having the sport of beach volleyball be a collegiate sport and players starting to play it much younger in on the club level. Well, you, uh, you did the impossible, you know, you qualified for the Olympics, you know, you had a great experience. Um, and you didn't say, well, okay, you know, uh, let's walk away. You came back and did it again. You know, uh, tell us a little bit about that second Olympic experience. That was a decision that my sister and I made, you know, once we had the momentum from the first Olympics, we decided to make it a full-time commitment and um, started playing on the professional beach volleyball tour. From there, we ended up qualifying and finishing ninth in Athens. Now, that was another incredible story because in our, in our group in Athens, we had the former Olympic champions from Australia. We had the European champions, the current European champions from Germany, and we had the Asian champions from China in our group. And, and so it was stacked against us. And to make matters worse, in Athens, the conditions were very, very difficult. It was extremely hot. And the sand that the organizers had brought in to make the uh, Olympic Stadium was, <coughs> excuse me, what we call very deep. It was really difficult, extremely difficult to move around. And we were only allowed to have two practices before we started the competition. So we, we go and play Australia and we lose miserably in our first game. But instead of going back to the Olympic Village, my sister and I looked at each other right after the game. It was that moment when, you know, we walked away from the court before we even got to the locker room and we said, <clears throat> we're not going out like that. So instead of going to the locker room, we walked around the stadium to the practice courts. Now we were allowed to have unlimited practice time and we stayed and practice until it was dark. Another four hours just to get used to the conditions. Ended up in a thrilling match beating the European champions from Germany, beating the Asian champions and qualifying for the round of 16, which set up this amazing match against Shelda and Adriana. Again, the number one team in the world at the time, poised to make their second Olympic run for the gold medal, only to be stopped in the final by Misty and Carey. Um, so, so that was a thriller, just absolutely the highlight of my sporting career. Um, ended up coming really, really close, you know, in that moment to, um, to defeating uh, those players. Uh, but we came up a little bit short in that moment. And, and again, looking back on that experience, I asked myself, could we have won that game? What would have happened? Honestly, the answer is this. We didn't aim high enough in that moment. And so this is another lesson that I had to learn through experience is how high do you set your goals? You know, I had thought we had set our goals extremely high as being the only players from several generations in Bulgaria to even make it to the Olympics. No other player before or after us has ever made it. And under those circumstances where I'm working and funding our training and our <laughs> coaching and everything else, uh, um, and I thought, you know, this was just a really high goal that I achieved. Looking back and being in the moment of that match, I realized we didn't set our goals high enough. So it's another lesson in, in not putting limits on your dreams and what you want to accomplish. And, and this is another thing that, you know, we go over in Close the Gap Leadership Training is how can you set up your program? How can you set up your, your vision and goals with, um, with realistic expectations, but yet aiming really high, you know, not, not putting limits on yourself that in the moment of competition or in the moment of presentations or whatever it is that will distract you from that. You know, again, and along the way, you did accomplish, you know, one major goal. You converted your sister into uh, someone who disliked beach volleyball and do, sounds like somebody who really embraced it. She really embraced it. And, you know, she, she was great and all her heart was in it. But to be honest with you, playing in the Olympics was my dream. Her dream was to be an astronomer. So after we finished playing and transitioned from 
you know, being professional players back to real life, she realized that she has another dream. And it was that childhood dream that she had. Now with the skills and the, you know, looking at how her mentality had developed, she went after that dream. And I have to tell you, Jake, going back to physics 101, taking on a 12 year journey, she just finished last year, defended her PhD in astrophysics and is now working for the International Space Telescope Institute. I think the only two-time Olympian to now be an astrophysicist too. <laughs> but talk about setting your goals high. There you go, absolutely. And it, it was you had a part in that, okay? All right, you know, you competed for at the national level. You're an international professional athlete. You got your degree and now, you take another leap and create this company. Let's talk a little bit about how Close the Gap came about and, and why our, our listeners, our athletic directors, how they can benefit from it. Absolutely. All along the way, I think I shared with you, I had this kind of scientific approach to everything. As a, as a trained scientist, biologist, I always like to get into the nitty gritty of the how do things actually happen and I like to break things down so, you know very complex tasks break them into small achievable steps so I've always wanted to take the lessons that I've learned along the way through many trials and tribulations a lot of them which you've heard and to come up with a system how do you achieve big big goals and and so I started asking myself these questions and, and looking back, it's like, what were the repeated, repeatable patterns? What were the mistakes that I was learning from and what were the lessons that I was learning? And, and so I came up with this acronym CLOSE, you know, coming from this idea of looking at where I started, you know, sitting on my couch, watching the Olympics on TV, having this huge gap that I talked about between where I was at the moment, where I wanted to be. And I thought, how can we close that gap? So there are five steps in that process. And the first one is having clarity. This is what the C stands for, having absolute clarity about what it is that you want to do. And even more importantly, why do you want to do it? So if you look back at some of those things that I described, it was those moments that I realized, why is this so important to me that gave me the strength to persevere? It's not that I was exceptional at anything. And I believe, I, you know, I'm just as ordinary. And sometimes, you know, I was even judged to be, um, to not have what it takes to make it at the highest level by getting cut from my coaches and, you know, having to prove myself. So I don't think there was anything extraordinary in me. I think it was the the steps that I was taking that are accessible to all of us in those moments. So by answering the question, why is this so important to you? Where do you want to go? What do you want to create? And why is it so important to you? That then it gives you the perseverance factor, which I talk about in step three. Now, the second step from this whole methodology that I'm using is called laser sharp focus. And you can see how it makes sense, right? Once you decide where it is you want to go, why you want to go there, who will benefit from it, then it's time for action. And it was that, um, it was that moment that I described of having the strategy of eliminating the distractions and focusing, zoning in on what are the achievable steps that are within your control right now? Now, this is what laser sharp focus is. You ask yourself the question, what is something I can do right now that will take me closer in the direction that I want to go? Now you see this question is really powerful because it has four components in it. The first one puts the responsibility in your hands. It doesn't ask, what can my boss or principal do about this? It asks you as an athletic director, as a coach, as a player, what is something I can do? right now in this moment, not two years from now, not five years from now, not even two months from now, in this moment that will take me closer. So this is the third component of this question that we don't want to do too much too soon. This is how people get discouraged, right? All we want to do is take 
an inch closer in the direction that we want to go. So this is the second step in the program, which is having laser sharp focus. So C stands for clarity, L stands for laser sharp focus, O is all about overcoming obstacles and turning them into opportunities. Now, once you decide where you want to go and, and you've made the plan, you have a strategy of how you're going to get there, it's not like doors just fly open, right? It, just like in our case, it's not the other teams are not just going to roll over and give us their spot. In fact, you have to fight for it. How do you overcome obstacles? And it's by going back to that bigger picture of asking yourself that question, what does this mean to me? What is the change in the world that I want to see? And that change starts internally. It starts within us. It starts by asking ourselves to make that shift from the fear-based response and thinking about all the improbable outcomes and all the things that are in our way now to shifting and asking, how can I make it happen? And having that, you know, stepping up to the challenge, right? So this is what neuroscientists talk about, going from a fear response to a challenge response, where now you use that fuel, that energy to create the outcome that you want to create. Now, from there, you really have three ways to respond. And this is what I talk about in step four in that process, which is shifting for growth. This is what the S stands for, shift for growth. You can shift you can discover that this is the most important thing to me in the world. I'm going to do anything to make it happen. And you persevere, you stay the course. Or you could be like my younger sister and decide that I want to make a change in direction because there's something that's more important to me. And so you shift in a different way. Or sometimes we come to a place where you realize it's time to let go. And there's a Turkish proverb that I love using, which is, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong road, turn around, right? As a result of an obstacle, what you see coming in front of you, you ask yourself that bigger question, you realize, you know what? It's time to let go. This strategy and this route is not working for us. The most sane thing to do is let go and start over and do something else. So that's the, that's the shift that happens um, in those three different ways. And E, the last step, the fifth step in the process, stands for encoding this transformation mindset into everything that you do. So it, it starts with evaluating the process at different steps of the way. Do you have um, different uh, metrics that can tell you if you're going the right way? E is basically a toolbox, right? All the different tools that we use in order to cultivate the right mindset that help us achieve the big things that we want to achieve. And, and um, you know, it, it's things like having the right uh, mindfulness practice, right? So that you watch what's happening in your head during that time. And what are the messages that you're giving yourself? Are they messages that were told by somebody else? You know, you don't have what it takes, but I do. I want to prove it right. I do have what it takes. So who are you listening to in those moments so that you persevere? So that's what E stands for. That's the five-step five process of closing the gap, achieving big goals, going from where we are to where we want to be. Uh, I'm going to, you're watching, so you could probably see me writing those things down. So uh, I want to uh, make sure I've got them uh, uh, in order here. Clarity, uh, the laser focus, okay? uh, overcoming obstacles and uh, turning them into opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, shift for growth, uh, and then encoding the mindset into everything that you do. Okay? Is that okay. right? That's exactly right. You got it. <laughs> okay. What, um, um, obviously you do this uh, as uh, part of your program uh, and it's been very, um, uh, you've used it a lot with a lot of corporations and a lot of schools. Um, you know, if one of our listeners, an athletic director, you know, wanted to get in touch with you and, and maybe explore the possibilities of, uh, of uh, having you come and, and speak at their school or helping them with the, your program, how's the best way that they can get in touch with you? The best way is to go to my website. There's a couple ways to do that. lenataylor.com is probably the easiest to remember, L-I-N-A taylor.com. 
closethegapleadership.com is will also take you there and give you access to um, how to get in touch with me. And you could all, always reach out on LinkedIn um, at Lena Taylor. INT is my handle of, of how to get a hold of me. That's uh, actually how we first met. I actually, I think I saw one of your postings from your uh, days as a ph pharmaceutical person there. It just really, uh, it spoke to me. Um, we've had a really um, compressed look at all of the things that uh, go into Lena Taylor and close the gap, but we're not done yet. Okay. Uh, we always like to finish with what we call the athletic director's toolbox. Uh, you certainly demonstrated, you know, your knowledge about the athletic world and uh, training and coaching and motivation. But right now, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Uh, I'm going to ask you to come up with three tools that should go into uh, a new or an old athletic director's toolbox. What three things would you like to see in Lena Taylor's athletic director toolbox? Jake, this is a really good question. The first thing that I think is the basis of everything is cultivating awareness. Awareness is what I say. I have a, a saying that I like to use, but if you want a shortcut to success, develop awareness. And it's easier said than done because it requires a deep examination of our beliefs, how we see the world, what we believe and how we got those beliefs. So awareness, I believe is where everything starts. Developing awareness about what it is that you want to accomplish, but also the people that you're working with and helping them cultivate that awareness. What are some of the, the shortcomings that they have? Where do they come from? What are some of the, uh, the limiting beliefs that we have that seem to dictate the circumstances of our life sometimes? So awareness is number one. The second one that has been really useful in the last year is cultivating gratitude. Now, especially in times when we see the mental health crisis in, as a result of so many things that have been uprooted in, in uh, uh, completely outside of our control, right? Uh, everything that happened over the last year. So the biggest lesson that I've learned there is to always start with gratitude. What is true right now? What am I grateful for? What is my starting point? What is something that I can shift my mind to that will put me in this seeing the glass half full kind of thing? Because what I've learned from elite sports and how to perform under pressure and, and, and the high performance principles is that where we place our focus is the most important thing and probably the only thing that we have control over, right? Where we place our focus. And so I think practicing gratitude is, as a starting point of what's true right now. And then from there, looking at, okay, what do you want to create? And even, even practicing gratitude for something that you want in the future. That's been the, the second most useful thing. And the third one, I believe, is cultivating curiosity. You know, don't assume you know everything. Ask great questions. Get to know the people around you. Get to know what's important to them. The number one way to motivate people is to know what's in their hearts. Ask this question, what is important to you? Even the students that we work with, you know, they are people. They are not somebody that, you know, has to listen and follow orders. There are people with their own dreams, with their aspirations, with their own challenges. Get to know the people around you. Ask curious questions. And, and those are the three. So awareness, cultivate awareness, awareness, gratitude, and curiosity. It, again, you saw me writing these down and we've done um, quite a few of these interviews in the past year and uh, we've collected, uh, I'm gonna say well over 500 tool suggestions. And some of them have been the same, but uh, I'm gonna say right now that these three are my favorites. And I love <laughs> how you use that word cultivate, um, certainly an athletic director needs to be aware uh, they need to, you always hear coaches especially, but sometimes ADs, you know, complaining about, oh, I wish we had a second gym or I wish we had this or we had that. Hey, you need to be thankful for what you do have. Uh, don't be satisfied, but be thankful. And then again, cultivating uh, in yourself 
and you said this with all three, uh, cultivating curiosity uh, with your coaches, with your student athletes. Um, great, great tools. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing those. And, and thanks for being on the podcast today. Thank you, Jake. It was a pleasure. Okay. Uh, one more time, uh, we've been visiting with uh, Lena Taylor, uh, two-time Olympian, and also the uh, founder of Close the Gap uh, Leadership Program. Uh, Lena, one more time, uh, let our listeners know how they can get in touch with you. LenaTaylor.com, that's L-I-N-A. T-A-Y-L-O-R.com, lenataylor.com, closethegapleadership.com. And I also have started a podcast called Next Level Tips. It's on Spotify. So for listeners to dive into those stories, those pivotal moments of, of the different people that I've been privileged to work with over the last year, some of CEOs and founders of um, some of the major companies that we have in our world today. And I asked them this question, of what was that pivotal moment that allowed you and was the bridge that took you from where you were in your life to where you wanted to be. So it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Make sure you check that out. Uh, Next Level Podcast on Spotify. Well, to our listeners, uh, thanks so much for uh, tuning in. Remember that the Zoom recordings of these interviews are uploaded to the FIAAA Educational AD Podcast YouTube channel. Uh, thanks again for listening. Come back again next time for another episode of the Educational AD.